morning. Welcome to Fountain Street Church on this beautiful summer Sunday morning. You are invited to worship. I always struggle with the term worship. But I think we're going to do a little of that today. Worshiping the ideals that we all strive for in our life. To lift them up and say, yes, we worship those ideals. So bring your hearts and minds. Leave behind those things that might distract you from focusing on developing your inner spirit today. And we begin by singing two patriotic songs uh, today that will open and close with what's in the bulletin, not in the hymnal. We we will get to the hymnal in a a moment, but uh, uh, today we're going to focus on some pretty patriotic stuff, and I'll explain that later. But let's Let's embrace the values of this testimony. seated. Again, welcome. Uh, My name is Dave Smith. Many of you know I've been on staff here very part-time, but very much enjoy my involvement with Fountain Street. I've been connected since 2005, so it's it's been a few years. Um, Do a lot of the weddings and funerals and some calling out to Porter Hills and some other places. So welcome. Let us join together in the responsive invocation. We celebrate the birth of our nation's ideals, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and unalienable rights, that all are created equal, and government powers are from the consent of the governed. We celebrate the ideals of our freedom, of speech, of the press, and to assemble for whatever religious or secular beliefs we embrace. We seek a more perfect union where justice, tranquility, and the general welfare are a reality. Thank you. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. That would lead beautiful into prayer, meditation, and silence, but we're not going to do that at this point. <laughs> I would like to do the reading here, and we'll do the prayer, meditation, and silence a little bit later. You ought to be able to find a hymnal there somewhere. And I invite you... To begin, we'll turn to hymn numbered one. So if you find that page, that will help us find the other page because the, the pages prior are not numbered. So if you find hymn numbered one, turn back one page. And on the left, you find a statement that begins, we the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association covenant to affirm and promote these principles. They're known as the seven principles of the UU. They're on their UUA website if you would like a copy of them. And I would like us to read in unison those seven affirmations. Let's begin. The inherent worth and dignity of every person, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, acceptance of one another, an encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations, a free and responsible search for truth and meeting, the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Now I invite you to share your gifts and offerings to sustain the ministries of this church. Thank you. 
So we come to a time now of prayer and meditation. Let us join ourselves in deep personal reflection. Deep spirit within me, embrace your own worth and dignity as you also commit to the ideal of respecting the worth and dignity of every person. Deep spirit within me, keep in mind sacred values and noble ideals. Keep in mind justice and equity and compassion in all human relations. Be reminded of so many good people who have served these noble ideals throughout our country's history. Even as we pray that that might continue, that we might not abandon and lose these ideals Deep spirit within me, stay strong. Do not be derailed by ill thought or negativity or the challenges of the day. Embrace moments like these, but also reach out and embrace this community of like-minded people. Be sustained by their strength and optimism and encouragement. And deep spirit within, you also be one who encourages and supports and loves all people of goodwill. Deep spirit within, never give up and building a community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. We are grateful for all those who've gone before, who've set before us these wonderful and noble ideals. They are a challenge and a comfort May we be strengthened to live a life worthy of them. Amen.
What a wonderful selection. My mind went around the world and back into history to think about all those who have meditated on sacred ideals and noble values because that music just evokes such divine thoughts. I'd like to begin with a little personal privilege of saying some things about my personal life and why I'm doing this sermon today. I love my country and I'm a patriot. In 1966, when Uncle Sam wanted me, it was the time of the draft, when I met my wife, she said, did, did you have a, a, a low number? And I said, honey, I was before numbers. <laughs> and for those of you who were part of the draft at that point, you know what that meant. Because they did a lottery on your social security number after that. But anyway. So I was sworn in as a second lieutenant in the United States Air Force. And that oath for commissioned officers has been remained the same over the years. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. Now, I know some of you out there are, have been in the military, both as enlisted and officer, and you've made that sworn statement of allegiance. I've had some politicians who've made that sworn statement of allegiance. 
the leaders of our nation supposedly have made that sworn statement of allegiance. And we're going to talk a little about that today. I've had a total of 34 years military, four years active, 30 in the National Guard. I'm officially a retired major. I've been mindful of military and political policies and activities throughout my life. It's been a, one of my areas of interest. And I love to preach around July 4 because I think there's a wonderful marriage, I think as it should be, between religious ideals and our nation's ideals. For our quotes in the bulletin by John Adams, the very top of the bulletin under the date, <clears throat> our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to govern any other. However, he also said, the government of the United States is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. And then when legislature is corrupt, the people are undone. Obviously, John Adams knew the corruption of religion. And he's talking about a higher moral and ethical value, not just religious doctrine. And I want to go back and share a little history. I only recently had the opportunity to try to, to make this as succinct as it is printed in the bulletin for you. I want to review the religion as it existed in the colonies in the early days because it helped shape our country and the ideals we have. There were several pockets of religious extremism and several pockets of religious freedom. In Massachusetts, when they landed there at Plymouth Rock in 1620 and founded the Plymouth Colony, it was established by the Puritans. Now, the Puritans wanted to purify English Protestantism. They didn't like the English Protestantism created by the king. Essentially, it just transferred Catholicism and all of its pomp and circumstance as a Protestant religion. And so the Church of England, Anglicanism, was quite formalized and the Puritans didn't like that at all. They wanted to be more strict with their Calvinism. And of course, that one of the things that resulted from that was the Salem witch trials in which they hanged 19 persons, 14 women and five men. And that was about the time that it, it really fell apart for them. And then the Massachusetts Bay Colony took them over. Boston became the capital. and the Plymouth Colony diminished in its influence. But it was 1692 when those 19 people were hanged. So that was a number of years of Calvinist rule, about 72 years in that Plymouth Colony. That was quite oppressive. And we get to New York City, the Dutch Reformed settled there. That was a, a form of strict Dutch Calvinism. And it was the rule of the Reformed Church in America. The Reformed Church in America we have here in West Michigan was from that. And they passed laws to establish, to, uh, to uh, prohibit the establishing of houses of worship uh, for everybody but, but the Dutch. I mean, in, but this included Quakers and Jews and Lutherans. Now, the Dutch were defeated by the English troops. No bloodshed, it was noted. And the English began to rule then, uh, and there was some religious freedom, although you can imagine the culture was still pretty, pretty difficult. The city was then renamed from New Amsterdam to New York. Now, in Pennsylvania, both the Dutch and the English fought over that, so they had some religious rule, I suppose. 
But then in 1667, there was an agreement between England, France, and the Netherlands. I mean, they felt they owned everything, right? Native Americans didn't figure in, the, in this at all. And so England took control. And then King Charles, because he felt he owned all this, gave William Penn a land grant, the largest loyal, royal land grant uh, ever, to settle a debt. And he was given Pennsylvania. But Penn, fortunately, was an early advocate of democracy and religious freedom, and uh, especially notable for his good relations with the Indian tribes. And under his direction, the city of Philadelphia was, was planned and developed, of course, Philia and Delphia being the city of brotherly love. So there was a pocket of religious freedom. And that's where our country's founding documents came out of is Philadelphia. Now, Maryland was an interesting situation in that the English Roman Catholics, uh, there was this guy, the second Baron Baltimore, who was the proprietor of the Maryland colony. And this was a time of religious persecution in England for the Catholics. And he promoted religious tolerance in Maryland, and that became a haven for Roman Catholics. Now, Virginia is another interesting case because Anglicanism came to Virginia immediately upon the arrival of the, in the settlement of Jamestown. The Church of England was the established church in Virginia for 179 years. And, under, and through those 179 years, slavery became more and more legalized and entrenched. While the Anglican Church in the state of Virginia were married. 179 years of the development of slavery, really. But then, in 1786, was the disestablishment of the Church of England in Virginia and guaranteed freedom to people of all religious faiths, including Christians of all denominations and the Jews and the Muslims and the Hindus. The statute was a notable precursor of the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, and that was written by Thomas Jefferson. And I make a note at the bottom there that Jefferson, uh, who is buried at, at Monticello, has an epitaph on his stone m remarking about three things, and this is what he wanted mentioned. Number one, that he was the author of the Declaration of Independence the father of the University of Virginia, but importantly, that he was the author of the Statue of Virginia for Religious Freedom. So when our founding fathers met in Philadelphia, they had this history of religious brutality and exclusion. You know, we, our mythology says that they all came here for religious freedom. No. They came here to establish their religious oppression according to their rules because they didn't like the religious oppression in Europe. And as I say, there were some pockets of, of freedom. A Rhode Island was founded because uh, of, uh, Roger Williams wanted to establish a little pocket of freedom up in New England. So here we have this history of conflicts of religion. So. Virginia was Anglican, Maryland was Catholic, New York City and New York State were Dutch, and the Congregationalists uh, came out of this Calvinism of New England. So when they got to Philadelphia, they said, man, there's no way that we can allow this. We, we need to cre create a neutral environment. And they did. They tried. There were a couple of columns in the newspaper on July 4. I hope you read them. E.J. Dion and George Will. Now, I love George Will about 10% of the time. <laughs> and this is part of that 10%. <clears throat> but first, I want to talk about E.J. Dion. 
He wrote, our patriotism, our, ours is a patriotism that is worth defending, and I would say celebrating and dedicating ourselves to. Quote, our choice of July 4th as our day of national celebration is itself significant. It memorializes not a great military victory, but an essay explaining why our country exists. The document is universal, even cosmic in its claims. Its key line, so familiar, is radical and it remains so. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now just a comment about that. Number one, we realize it's just not all men. There, it's a universal statement here. But also that the unalienable rights are not just life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That all men are created equal and are endowed with a creator with certain unalienable rights. And among these are these three things. So there's others. And he ends saying this, American patriotism rests not on power and might, but on a loyalty to the equal rights of all, to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is an ideal that we celebrate, and that's, of course, why militarizing our celebration on the 4th of July is such blasphemy against our country's founders. Yeah. George Will had an interesting column, too. And I'll, <laughs> I'll make a comment about his writing style. First of all, there are arguments about America's nature and meaning. And he says that our concerns are about the relevance of the Declaration of Independence to the contested question of how to understand or construe the Constitution. The crucial question is, what did the founding fo founders intend? What was their foundational purpose? And he comments, concerning the Constitution's original meaning and continuing purpose, the Declaration, the Declaration of Independence, its role is the locus classicus concerning the framers' intention which is surely the master key to properly construing what they wrought. Good old George lo <laughs> loves, to, loves to write that kind of stuff. And so we have really the, the Declaration of Independence setting the stage for and helping us understand the purposes of our Constitution. And we have a preamble to the Constitution that tells us why they wrote it why we are forming this nation, what, our, what are our ideals and principles and purposes. And as you can see, I've printed this out on the insert there. Now, I've put bullet points just because it's easier to understand. Those six ideals in the preamble we the people, and you, you remember seeing that, that's the big headline, right? We the people of the United States, in order to do these six things, do ordain and establish this Constitution. What are the six things we're trying to do? What is it about our national character that ought to be part of our personal character? Well, to form a more perfect union. What does that mean? Well, it certainly doesn't mean we ought to divide ourselves up into red and blue states and gerrymander our way into political power and divide and pit people against each other. I think as in a marriage, you try to make a more perfect union by being respectful and loving and kind. The second thing we wanted to do was establish justice, and it's clear justice for all. Justice not just for the wealthy, but also for the poor. A little problem we have today. To ensure domestic tranquility. 
Well, that's not the way our politics works, is it? It's almost the opposite of that. Let's stir the pot. Let's just make things as riled up as we can. If we, if we can create chaos among the citizens, they're much easier to rule. We need to dedicate ourselves to some domestic tranquility. Provide for the common defense. Oh boy, have we done that one. We have overdone that one. Like I say, I'm a military guy with 34 years of credited service and I am appalled and disgusted and upset about a $700 billion military budget that is just outrageous. And we're, we're selling jets to Taiwan, by the way. I mean, did you read that one recently? Yeah. We're the arms dealer of the world, selling arms to Saudi Arabia, to everybody we can. I mean, it's okay. Good for business. They say the, uh, what was it, the tanks? I think the tanks they were selling to Taiwan, I believe. And uh, it's going to create, create some jobs in Ohio. We can't afford to do the infrastructure now. Realize that. But we can build weapons. We can't afford that. Promote the general welfare. That, well, that's been rewritten. We, we promote corporate profits now. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice to promote the general welfare of our neighbors and, and citizens and, and maybe even non-citizens? I mean, who are we the people? I mean, at the time they wrote this, we the people was a whole bunch of immigrants. A ton of immigrants, almost everybody. <laughs> oh, there were a few that had been around for, yeah. But, yeah, the general welfare, not just welfare for some or, no. Promote the general welfare. And then secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and everybody else. Wonderful ideals. And that's why our country was established. And that's what we ought to be dedicated to today. And it seems we've drifted so far away. And of course, when they wrote that constitution, after they got done with the mechanics, and essentially, the Articles of the Constitution are the mechanics. Article 1 is the, Constitu is the Congress, Article 2 is the Presidency, Article 3 is the Judiciary, and so on. So this is how we construct our government. And they got done with that, and they realized we need some guarantees that this structure doesn't become oppressive on the people. So number one, we need some freedoms guaranteed. So we have the Bill of Rights, right? The first ten amendments to the Constitution that was written with it and adopted also at about the same time. And just the First Amendment, respecting an establishment of religion, no law to do so, no law to ever establish religion or prohibit the, the free exercise thereof. Now we've got a little perversion of that going on right now, approved by the Supreme Court that says if I own a business, and my religious conscience tells me I don't need to bake a cake for a certain brand of people. I don't need that do, to do that. You know, do I need to sell real estate to a Muslim? Hey, what if my religious conscience tells me I don't want to do that? Well, the Supreme Court has not only made corporations people, they've made religion an excuse for discrimination. And where else we're going with the Supreme Court, I don't know, but it's damn scary. So far we have freedom of the press and freedom of speech. I say so far, we don't know where we're going with that one either. Certainly, um, the efforts of some in our government are to suppress those freedoms, not honor them or expand them. 
And then, of course, the last one, the right of the people to peacefully assemble and petition the government for redress of grievances. I think that's been rewritten too. It's the right of people to pay their politicians a lot of money. Yeah, we, we've got a whole set of problems. But we have these ideals. And what I want to call us to today is a celebration of them and a rededication to them. Because we need these not only as a country, very badly we do, but, but as individuals to respect each other and to realize that all human beings are created equal, worthy of dignity and respect. Even the worst criminals deserve due process of law. We put them in jail, but we feed them. We give them toothpaste and soap and blankets and a place to sleep. That's because we still respect individuals and their human dignity, even as we have to ensure that some people are locked away. But of course, all the folks on the border have not committed a crime at all. Seeking asylum is a totally legal process. The fact that we have some politicians immediately declaring them all illegals, that of course is not accurate at all. These are people seeking asylum. They have a legal right to do so by our US laws as well as international law. But that process is being perverted. So we need to hold our politicians accountable to these principles, even as we dedicate ourselves personally to living them out in our daily life. Because we hope we have a government, as I quote a portion of the Gettysburg Address at the bottom of that page, that we have a government of the people, by the people, for the people. And hopefully it shall not perish, but who knows? We've got a scary future ahead of us. Staying informed is important, but do not be overwhelmed with the task. Stay connected to community and those people of like-minded interests to uh, sustain you. That's why we gather as a church, and particularly this church, with these values. How many of you remember that there was that seven principles of you, you, in the, have, how many are aware of that, those seven principles? Okay, a few of you. Yeah, I don't know. I, it, it was in the hymnal. I said, let's, let's uh, celebrate those. We abound in wonderful ideals. Religion should teach wonderful ideals, like the golden rule is a pretty good start. Religion well done should help people develop moral character, should help us to understand that all are created equal and, and endowed by whatever creative energy has brought forth our lives, that we're all equal. May you be blessed every holiday to find the ideals and principles that gave birth to that celebration. We have Labor Day coming up. I was so privileged to, to go to a seminary in Chicago where there was a lot of labor history. And I took two courses on labor history as part of my seminary experience. Most people don't do that. Um, but it was a wonderful exposure for me to study about that. So we have Labor Day coming. I, I did a sermon on Labor Day here a couple years ago on some of those principles. We come, we gather to be inspired, to be encouraged, to meet friends. But let's walk away 
more dedicated to the task of living out these glorious principles that the founding persons gave us in the beginning of this country. May you be blessed in your journey as a citizen of this United States. Thanks to all of you who've served this country in a variety of capacities, because I know you have. And we serve it just also by being a good citizen, by protesting the bad things we need to protest and by celebrating the good things we need to promote. May you be blessed in your journey. Amen. And the hymn on the back of the, I don't know why they didn't put these in the hymnal, but they just want to do a little separation of church and state there, I guess. Embrace the noble ideals and resist, resist the destruction of our democracy. Amen. <laughs>